Hello and welcome to the AutoX Show. Now we've got a lot of two-wheel action on the show for you today. You can have both the Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 and KTM Duke 390 for roughly the same amount of money. So which should you choose? The modern classic Enfield or the performance-oriented KTM? We also bring you the incredibly fast BMW S1000RR and the really audacious Ducati Diavel 1260. But first, here are Jared and Ravi with the RE and KTM. So Royal Enfield was very successful when they brought in their twin motorcycles. They launched the bike last year globally and we were there for the US launch. We had an amazing time riding the bikes there and we were very impressed. And then a few months later, they came to India and they had the India launch here. And we got to ride the bikes right here in our country. And we had a fantastic time riding them. And I have to say that these bikes are fantastic. The Interceptor 650 right here is probably one of the best motorcycles you could... Oh, look who it is. So Janet, I see you're still raving on about the Interceptor 650. Why don't we measure it against this, the Duke 390? It makes more or less the same amount of power and torque and the prices of both these motorcycles are just a few thousands apart. Okay, Ravi, that's true. He's got a fair point. We need to find out which one of these bikes is better. So let's hit the road and let's find out. There's just so much to like about the 390 Duke and I know just where to start with. The 390's motor is so energetic and lively that it's hard not to have fun on the road. It makes every journey from your regular commute to work to riding hard on the hills incredibly involving and dramatic. It makes going fast easy and eggs you to keep pace with the motorcycle. The engine is punchy, it has a strong mid-range, the acceleration is crisp and if I should tell you, it's as fast to reach the 100 as the Ford Mustang. Now that's a proper pocket rocket. Okay, so hold your horses, Ravi. The Interceptor 650 actually gets more power and torque than the Duke 390. In fact, the engine is so nice, you have such a wide torque spread and you get the torque all the way from as low as 2,500 RPM and you can ride all day long. It's so comfortable. The Interceptor also has the advantage of being twin cylinder, which makes it a lot more refined than the Duke 390. In fact, the smoothness with which it delivers power will actually surprise you. Unlike the 390 Duke, the Interceptor can maintain high speeds in a lot more stress-free manner, which makes it an extremely capable touring option. I love the seating position and it's just such an easy rider and with that much power it can even keep up with the Duke 390. And anyways, the Duke 390 is not a very comfortable machine. I don't like the riding posture whatsoever. The foot pegs are way too rear set and it's a very cramped position, especially for tall riders. The Royal Enfield may have a comfortable riding posture, but the forward by its stance of the Duke 390 adds more weight to the front end, which gives better feel around corners. And then the Duke also comes with a slipper clutch, which makes it that much more confident and safer while riding aggressively. The Mezzilla tyres are super sticky, even in these wet conditions they provide great grip. In comparison, the Pirellis that the Interceptor comes with just aren't as good. Now let me also remind you that the Interceptor weighs 202 kilos. Now that's 40 kgs heavier than this one here. All the additional weight of the Interceptor just cannot be masked. The Duke on the other hand is much lighter, it's much more easier to manage whether it is pushing in and out of parking or even when you're riding it round bends. And also, the suspension setup on the Duke 390 is so stiff and I have to agree, yes, of course, it helps in the handling, but in all honesty, if you're going to be riding on all kinds of road surfaces, the Interceptor 650 is so much better going over bad surfaces. The setup is so much softer and it's way more pliant on all roads and that's what I love about the Interceptor 650, is that you can use it in all conditions. Fine, I will give you that. But you're totally missing how Royal Enfield has managed to offer a 650 parallel twin at such an affordable cost. It barely has any features. It's not liquid cooled, it doesn't have a LED setup, it doesn't have a digital instrument cluster, and 
what's with the quality and what's with the design. Those indicators look straight out of a commuter from the 90s. And let's talk about commutes again. If you're going to be commuting in the city, the Intercept 650 is so much nicer. It's got a longer wheelbase and the seat is just so nice and comfortable. The Duke is so cramped and there's no space for even a pillion rider. I think the Interceptor 650 is giving the Duke 390 a tough fight and for that I'm going to bring out the value card. The Duke 390 is just so much better value for money proposition. You get a ton of rider aids, you get switchable ABS, ride by wire and a slipper clutch. None of that is on the Interceptor and by that the Duke 390 is much better value for money proposition. And to give you a recap of everything else I've mentioned already, it handles better, it has grippier tires and above all, it is a lot better balanced. And I'm going to emphasize strictly here on the word everyday practicality of a big bike. The Interceptor 650 feels like a big bike, it rides like a big bike, but it's also so practical. You can ride it in the city all day long and it's got just the right amount of power for you to smile all the time. And if you want to go on a nice highway cruise, it's much more comfortable. It's got that great twin feel. And of course, it's got a universal appeal, the way it's designed, the way it looks. It's such a nice bike. In fact, the motto for this bike is pure motorcycling and that's exactly what this bike is. It's a pure motorcycle. You're growing old, Jared. You know the Duke is a much better product, but your age is just not allowing you to enjoy it fully. So I'm just gonna go out and hit the road. You're absolutely right, Ravi. Let's just get out there and ride. We're never gonna have an answer to this conversation because both bikes are fantastic in their own right. Both are iModi winners and they each have their own character and appeal to different customers. So let's just hit the road and have some fun. Now don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Shivang rides the latest BMW S1000RR at the BIC. Welcome back to the AutoX show. Now if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we tested MG's debut model for India, the Hector. Well, it's finally been officially launched and the company has really thrown a spanner in the works. Not only is it the largest car in its class and the only one that offers its level of tech and connectivity, but it's also really competitively priced at 12.18 to 16.88 lakhs. So if you missed our review from a few weeks ago, check it out on YouTube. Now, there's nothing quite like a liter class superbike on a racetrack. So here's Shivank having a blast with the BMW Motorrad S1000RR at the Bud International Circuit. So 2009 and 2010 were the years when the world was going through a rough phase. We were still recovering from the Great uh, Recession and uh, there was slowdown everywhere including the automotive industry. But in the middle of all of this, uh, BMW Motorrad decided that they want to have a go in the cutthroat leader class superbike segment and that's when they launched the S1000RR. Now that was the time when this segment was ruled by the Honda Fireblades and Yamaha R1s and Kawasaki Ninjas of the world. So BMW, uh, a brand that was known for making GS motorcycles, adventure motorcycles and tourers, they came out of nowhere and they caught a brand new bike. And there were the newcomers in the segment, so nobody took them seriously. Especially with that asymmetric face, uh, that bike uh, didn't look all that special. But when the riders around the world rode it, the BMW S1000RR instantly gained the cult status in the superbike world. 
and since then they have been at the top of their game. You see the original S1000RR was the first bike to launch with many segment first features. It was the first leader class super bike to come with traction control among many other features. And it was such a phenomenon that it blew the pants of all its rivals. However, over the time the competition has definitely caught up and there are a lot of rivals who do things slightly better than the old S1000RR. Now to address this, BMW has now launched the all new third generation motorcycle and there are a lot of changes. And the new version has just gone on sale in India. And here it is, the all new third generation BMW S1000RR. It has just landed on our shores and as per BMW, it's a completely new bike. They've built this completely from the ground up and they go as far as to claim that this bike doesn't even have one single bolt from the previous model. So imagine that's the kind of confidence they have and there's a lot of promise in this motorcycle. And yeah, there are a lot of new changes. We'll come to that later on. But right now it's time to hit the track and I think I've been looking forward to ride the S1000RR and it goes all the way back to the original from 2009. So yeah, let's hit the track. Everything is new here. And while that's great news, not everyone is pleased about one aspect of this new model. And that's because the asymmetrical headlamps of the old model are gone. Instead, this new S1000RR features a pair of sleek LED headlamps. Now you can't deny that it looks very pretty now, but the aggression has been toned down somewhat. Plus the predator face of the old model used to be the S1000RR signature dish. That was what made it unique. Apart from the new conventional face, the third gen S1000RR is as compact as its predecessor, which means dimension wise, it's more super sport than super bike. In fact, at 2073 mm, it's only around 70 mm longer than the TBS Apache RR310. This is also the first time that a BMW motorcycle is coming with the brand's revered M badge. Here though, the M package brings a special racing red, blue and white color, carbon fiber wheels and a lightweight lithium-ion battery. Speaking of weight, at 197 kilos, the new RR is 11 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. While in M spec, it weighs even lighter, only 193.5 kilograms. The new S1000RR now also comes equipped with a crisp 6.5 inch TFT display and it's packed with features. And I feel this screen is definitely the best in the segment. Lightness was the buzzword during the launch of the new S1000RR as BMW claims to have shaved kilos and grams from anywhere they could. The main contribution however comes from the engine as it's a full 4 kilos lighter. The 999cc inline 4 is all new but retains the bore and stroke of the old bike. But it's got a few new tricks up its sleeve. First up, it gets BMW shift cam technology, which basically varies valve timing and valve stroke on the intake side. That means there are two sets of cam lobes, one for low RPMs to boost low end torque and improve efficiency, while the other to offer more lift at high RPM to enhance the top end. Coupled to the shift cam are 10% lighter hollow bore titanium valves, meaning the, all the internals are featherweight and the engine can steam all the way up to a red line of 14,600 RPM, which is 400 revs more than the old bike. All these updates combined result in a power bump of 8 bhp, meaning the peak horsepower output has now crossed the 200 bhp barrier. Torque is identical at 113 Nm, but because of the shift cam, BMW claims that at least 100 Nm of that is available from 5500 RPM. Performance wise, this engine is an absolute monster. The motor is throttle happy and revs manically. Of course, being an inline 4, it doesn't quite hammer out torque at low revs like say the Ducati Panigale's V4, but the acceleration is blistering fast once the engine revs past 10,000 RPM. All I can say is that it's mind-bending quick. Forget us mere mortals, even if you happen to be a seasoned racer, your brain will struggle to register the way this thing consumes straights. However, what really stands out about the S1000RR is that you never feel you're out of control. And that's the beauty of this machine. There are two reasons for this. First, the handling is simply epic. It feels completely dialed in at a racetrack thanks to its new lightweight flex frame, Marzocchi front forks with DDC semi-active suspension, a quick steering and carbon fiber wheels shot with sticky medzillers. And then there are the electronics. 
the S1000 RR is brimming with ride rates. There are four riding modes, rain, road, dynamic and race which are offered as standard. Plus there is an optional pro mode. In this, you can configure the throttle response, wheelie control, traction control, engine braking as per your requirements using three sub modes, race pro 1, 2 and 3. However, when I began, the bike was in standard race mode. But even in race mode, the electronics ensured that I felt like a superhuman of some sort. On the straights, you can open the taps fully and the bike doesn't even twitch. It just grips and darts ahead like there's no tomorrow. Similarly, on corner exits, you can open the throttle like an amateur, but instead of being launched into orbit, you exit corners glued onto the tarmac as if you are the next best thing in WSPK. Make no mistake though, the electronics do not sap any fun in the process. Neither do the electronics feel overbearing at any time. And this is precisely what makes the RR one of the most forgiving big bikes out there. Now while the double R completely blew my mind with its performance and agility, I felt the new Haze front brake, which replaced the Brembo's of the old bike, weren't as strong as I would have liked on a bike this powerful. Sure, the front brake lever has a progressive feel and it offers sharp performance, but at high speeds, especially above 250 kmph, I expected more bite from the front setup. So I've now ridden the third gen S1000RR at the Buddh International Circuit and what do I think about it? Well, to be honest, I don't consider myself qualified enough to come to a concrete conclusion and there are two reasons for that. First, I got very limited time with the bike, I only rode it for around 8 laps. And then there's the thing of its performance. You see, not everyone can exploit the kind of performance these bikes offer. Whether you are a racer or whether you are a regular track junkie, it doesn't matter because this bike will always offer you more and you can't really reach that level. But for me, the one thing that really stood out about the S1000RR is the fact that it's so manageable. I mean, anyone can get on that bike and they can straight away ride it. It's not scary. The electronics work in the background all the time and they make you feel like a superhero because all the time you're riding this bike fast, you feel like you're on the limit, but the bike is sorting out everything for you. And then other thing is it's very compact and it's lightweight. That means it's super agile as well. So if you are in the market with that sort of money and you want to buy a top dog liter class superbike, I think the new S1000RR makes a really solid case for itself. Now don't go anywhere because when we come back, Jared rides the new Ducati Diavel 1260. Welcome back to the AutoX show. Now the Ducati Diavel 1260 is a bike that's inspired by muscle cars and superheroes. And here's Jared's attempt to tame it. So every once in a while, a motorcycle comes into the market and disrupts everything. And that's exactly what the Ducati Diavel is. It is a mean looking machine. In fact, Ducati calls it a mega monster. Mega because it's huge, it's massive, it's bulky, it's fat, and it's really extraordinary looking. It's something unlike anything else you've ever seen before. Launched in 2011, this bike really shook up things. It's a power cruiser. It's also a sports bike, and it's also a street naked. It's everything combined into one mean machine. The Ducati Diavel has now been launched completely new. That's right, this is not a new facelift. This is actually a brand new motorbike. This is what Ducati has told us. So what have they done? Well, they've changed everything. 90% of this bike is absolutely new. What remains essentially is just the engine. It's the 1260cc engine that was first brought into the Multistrada. This new Diavel now gets more power and it's more agile as well. Well, we're gonna ride this bike around Spain in Marbella and we're going to have a great time with it, of course. This is the S version. There are two versions. This is the S version, which is the more sporty version, of course. And we're going to get on this bike, we're going to ride it around and see exactly what the changes have been made and how this bike is going to handle and perform. So, what's really different in this new bike? Well, almost everything. Let's start with the ergonomics, okay? 
So the riding position has been kept essentially the same as the old Ival. It's a very comfortable riding position, very low seat, nice handlebars, and the foot pegs kept a little bit in the midsection back. So it's sporty and comfortable at the same time. Uh, everything else is pretty nice as well. As you can see, the engine is very compact. Uh, it's been pushed back a little bit to allow the center of gravity to balance a little bit better. The water uh, radiator has also been pushed in and changed a little bit as well. So that's changed the entire dynamics of how the midsection of the bike is going to be. The wheelbase is a little bit shorter. What I really like about this bike is the seat. The seat is really comfortable. It allows you to go on long rides for, you know, for, for hundreds of kilometers and you won't have any pain whatsoever. It's very soft, very nice, very pliant. Another thing that really stands out is the rear tire. It's a massive. It's a 240 millimeter uh, wide tire and it's been specially designed by of course Pirelli which has been working with Ducati for a very long time. It's got new uh, alloy rims as well. Both are 17 inches uh, front and back. Exhaust sound also is phenomenal. It's very nice. Another thing you, that I want to mention is the electronics package that comes with this bike. Now this is the S uh, model. We haven't written the, the standard version. The S model uh, comes with a complete overhaul of electronic packages. You've got everything from traction control, you know, wheelie control. You got all different riding modes, different safety features as well. You got the TFT display. And overall, it's just such a sophisticated machine. I mean, it's got the sophistication of a super bike. It's got the handling of a nice sport naked. And it's got the power and acceleration of a really, really big power cruiser. So it's a very, very complex dynamic machine that can do almost anything and the way Ducati has brought it all together to fit into this package is actually outstanding it's remarkable really I can't even believe that they've managed to make this bike so flawless in the way it just uh, handles itself um, it's about 240 kilograms wet weight and that means it's a heavy bike of course but when you ride and you sit on it it just handles so superbly well I was blown away we were riding some beautiful roads here and you know turning into corners it's just phenomenal it's just mind-blowing actually i couldn't believe that this bike was doing what uh really fast sports bikes could do and of course ducati courses come in and they've given their inputs and they've designed a lot of this machine and you know electronics as well they've uh, done a lot there so they've made this bike really a high-tech marvel if i would like to say you have a great time riding it the S version obviously gets these older suspension in the front and a fully adjustable Owens at the rear as well. And that really helps the handling, of course. The rake has also been made steeper. Uh, so the steering is very direct and it's very nice, very confidence inspiring. And it's just, I'm blown away. I'm actually lost for words right now because I could never have imagined this bike to handle the way it did. The previous model I've ridden a few times, it was a good handler but it just didn't take on corners as well as this did. And of course, uh, the rear suspension was a little bit firm. Um, right now, we can't tell you exactly how good it's gonna be on Indian road conditions, but right now here in Spain, I can tell you the overall appliance of the ride is fantastic. The rear suspension is very nice. It's been made a little bit softer. So overall, great. The riding dynamics in terms of performance, handling, comfort, um, ergonomics, style. It's one of a kind of a bike for sure. It will be launched sometime next month, which is in August. Uh, we don't know exactly which ones will come, but I'm pretty sure the S model would come. I mean, why else would they invite us to Spain to ride the S model? Uh, price would be probably somewhere between 18 to 22 lakh, and that's going to be a very exciting package, obviously. Uh, this bike, uh, before, when it was launched in India, it was one of Ducati's best sellers, but now I believe the Monster 821 and the Scrambler have obviously taken over because they're a lot cheaper and more accessible. But this bike has been very popular in India, and I really think that, you know, when this comes in with the kind of package that it is and what it offers, I'm sure people will also love to get on this bike and go for a spin, take it for a test ride. And I'm sure people who have the, who have a lot of Ducati bikes would love to ride this. And, you know, honestly, even people who are into like riding on highways and cruising for a very long time, this is a, a very good machine. So in India, uh, the roads are getting better and better day by day. So if you want to go on long distance touring, if you want to go to the hills or some nice uh, curvy roads to have a good time on, this bike can do it. It can do it all, pretty much. So when it comes into India, go to your Dubai dealership, go for a test ride, and I'm telling you, you will fall in love with this machine just like I have right now. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on social media for your daily dose of all things automotive. And remember, it's chaos out there. So always buckle up and wear your helmets.
We'll see you again next weekend on The Auto X Show.